Recently, we had seen how perpendicular components of forces can cause objects to change direction, and we characterized how this could cause a twisting action by looking at torques. Now we're going to take a look at the other part, the parallel components of force. We remember there that uh, parallel and anti-parallel components of acceleration were associated with the change in speed of an object. And those would be due by Newton's second law to parallel or anti-parallel components of forces. So to characterize how a force is changing the speed of something, we define a quantity called the work. Now, this is another one of those terms that physicists use very precisely. Um, and the use in broader context is much uh, more varied. For us here, the th important thing to remember is that f work is done by forces on objects. And <clears throat> is the result of a force being applied through a distance. So let's say that we have an object that has displaced through some displacement D, like so. And let's say that one of many of the forces that are acting on this object is this particular force F. It can't be the only object, or sorry, it can't be the only force acting on the object. Otherwise, the object would also be changing direction because of the perpendicular component of the force. I just want to focus on this one force right here and so we can define the work done by it. So we'll break the force into the pieces that are parallel to the displacement and perpendicular to the displacement. And for now, we don't care about this. I said it, it is responsible for an object changing direction, and we've already dealt with that looking at centripetal forces and also torques. So here, the definition of work is the product of the parallel component of the force with the displacement. And if you want, another equivalent way to do it is you can put the tail, the tails of your force and your displacement vector together. Say that this is your angle phi here. And you can write this as FD, sorry, cosine phi. So the units here, we conventionally write as joules. Named after the guy who figured out that heat was energy in transfer. It has dimensions of Newtons times meters, but we don't write Newton meters. And this is because a Newton meter we reserve for torque, which is a force being applied at a distance, here, this is a force being applied through a distance. A torque is associated with the twisting of an object. Here, the force is being associated with the change in speed of the object. So these are two different physical quantities that happen to have the same physical dimension. So in order to keep them straight, in SI units, we write the units of work and energy as joules and the units of torque as newton meters, just so we can keep them straight. Now, this is a signed quantity here. Um, this angle could be anywhere between 0 and 180 degrees. So cosine could run anywhere from plus 1 to minus 1, so you'll have a sign. So we can interpret the signs 
by observing that if work is positive, this means that the parallel component of the force has to be pointing in the same direction as the displacement. So that means that you would be accelerating in the direction that you're already moving. So you would be picking up speed. On the other hand, if the sign is negative, that would mean that you have a parallel, the parallel component of the force would be pointing anti-parallel to the displacement. So that means the acceleration would be in the opposite of the direction you're going. Um, and so this would mean that the object was slowing down. The situation might look, say, something like this for that case. Here's our displacement. Let's say our force looks something like that. Again, we break out the perpendicular and the parallel components of the force. And here, F parallel would be pointing against the direction of motion. So by Newton's second law, you would be accelerating against the direction of motion, which means you would be slowing down. Okay. So where this is gonna be useful is a result called the work kinetic energy theorem. And I'm going to do a bit of a hand wavy derivation for it in one dimension and then just assert that the that's also true in two or three dimensions. And we'll also find that we will be writing more than one version of the work energy theorem. This one gets called the work kinetic energy theorem. So we'll start with our definition of work. But here let's take a look at the work done by all the forces acting on the object. Um, that would be equal to the net force being applied to the object times the displacement. And keep in mind, we're, all, we're working here in one dimension. So we don't have to worry about taking components. So by Newton's second law, the net force here would be equal to the mass times the x component of the acceleration, the displacement, if we go by go with the definition of displacement, that'll be the final position minus the initial position. All right, we recall from the gang of four um, that V final squared minus V initial squared is equal to two A sub X times X final minus X initial. So we can solve for this piece right here, the A X times X final minus X initial. And I would have to divide everything through by two. So I'd have one half V final squared minus one half v initial squared. Okay, so what we can do now is we can take this bit right here, recognize it's also that bit right there, and substitute. So when we do, we get that the network done is equal to 1 half m v final squared minus 1 half m v initial squared. We look at it and say, hey, that was what we defined to be the kinetic energy. So if you're wondering why that uh, funky factor of a half, that's why. So this is the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy. Or if we get really cute when we write it, we say W net equals delta K. Now I demonstrated this in one dimension. To demonstrate this in two or three dimensions, it's hairier. You can't just rely on uh, stealing, you can't completely rely on stealing a result from kinematics. But 
it's still true. It, it still works. It's still get the same result at the end. Okay, so let's start to do an example of this to see what it might be able to do for us. And right now, before we get the concept of potential energy fully developed, this is actually going to be a little awkward and you might question just how you can, you might be able to see that, yeah, it's a little quicker, but you might be questioning, you know, if it's really worth the investment. But once we get potential energy developed, I assure you it will be. So let's say that you're standing on top of a cliff. Let's say that cliff is 10 meters high. And let's say you are dropping a rock off the edge of the cliff after first having made sure that there's nobody beneath you. And you know that the rock is going to pick up speed. And so we want to know what it is at the end. And yes, you could totally do this by kinematics. But here I just want to do it by the work energy theorem so that we can assure ourselves that physics is consistent and we'll get the same result. So we can go and draw in the displacement of our rock. There it is. Our displacement points downward and it's 10 meters. And we can also draw in the force being applied to our rock. It's the force of gravity and it points straight down. So the angle between these is zero. So we can write either, we can say the work is equal to the parallel component force times the displacement, or we can just say, well, the force is gravity times the displacement times the cosine of the angle between them. Well, the angle between them is zero, and the cosine of zero is one. The force of gravity is mg, so we get that the work done uh, on it is MGD. And in this case, since gravity is the only force acting on it, the net work being done on the rock is the work done by gravity. Um, so by the work kinetic energy theorem, we can say this is equal to K final minus K initial. So let's put in what these things are. We have that the work done by gravity was MGD. So this would be 1 half MV final squared minus 1 half MV initial squared. And since we dropped the rock from rest, that term drops. We note again here, conveniently, the masses cancel, which is a good thing because I never said how massive the rock was. And we can solve for the final speed. Oops. So V final would be, okay, we times through by 2, 2 G, D. Since it's squared, we have to take the square root of both sides. So we get the square root of 2 G, D. And that should ring a bell for you. Um, this is exactly the same result we got when we did this by kinematics, which we would hope. So anyway, let's put in what these are. 2 times 9.8 newtons per kilogram times 10 meters. Here it's probably more useful to express a newton per kilogram. It's a meter per second squared. I'll times a meter per second squared by another meter. So I'll meters squared over second squared. Take the square root. I sure enough get meters. And in fact, I'll get 14 of them. Sorry, meters per second. Well, we get 14 meters per second, just like we did well, when we did this problem before with kinematics. Now, where things really shine is when the problems get a little more complicated. So, for the next one here, let's go back and revisit our friend the Atwoods machine. And again, we'll make this a massless pulley. And we will have strings that don't stretch and all that good stuff. 
And so we'll go ahead and do the same problem we did before. So we'll say this is M1 is five kilograms. And M2 is 10, oops, 10 kilograms. So we can go ahead and analyze this by making the entire Atwoods machine our system. Then there will be three forces that will be external to the system. There will be a tension in this hook here, but from a work perspective, that isn't going to matter. We'll get to that in a second. And then we will have gravity acting on each of these. And we will have to treat them separately here. So let's say that we let these start at rest. So V initial equals zero. And let's say we let them displace a meter. So when we get down here and up here, we would like to know what's the final speed. All right. So let's go first and think about this force due to tension acting on the pulley. From a work perspective, it's no great shakes because although we've got this tension force right here, um, the displacement of this pulley, the displacement is zero here, right? So the work done by this tension force is zero. So from a work perspective, we can ignore it. It's not doing anything to make the system go faster or slower. Okay. So then let's take a look at uh, gravity. So for gravity, we'll have to look here. So this will be FG1. And here we'll have, oops, a bigger arrow. FG2. Displacements are the same. So I'm not drawing forces, that's why they're blue and why I draw the arrows differently in order to tell. So when I connect them like this, we know that it's not a force that I'm drawing. There we go. So for this one here, the ang this one here, the angle in situation two for mass two is zero. Here, the angle is for situation one is 180 degrees. All right, so we already worked out that we can ignore the work done by the tension here because it isn't moving anything. Um, so we're left with the network being the work done by gravity on object one plus the work done by gravity on object two. So this will be FG one D Cosine of phi 1 plus F G D cosine phi 2. All right, we can go stick those angles in. That might be helpful. So this is going to be M1 G D cosine 180 plus M2, F G 2 there, M2 G D cosine zero. All right, so cosine D cos zero. All right, so the cosine of zero is plus one and the cosine of 180 is minus one. So I can clean this up a little bit. There's a G and D in both terms. So I can pull them out and I can rewrite this as M2 minus M1 GD. All right. But we know by the work energy theorem that the network is equal to K final minus K initial. Well, initially, nothing's moving. Since nothing's moving, the initial kinetic energy is zero. 
The final kinetic energy will be the sum of the kinetic energies of the two boxes. So this will be one half m2 v2 v final squared plus one half m1 v final squared. So one half m2 plus m1 v final squared. And we also said the network was m2 minus m1 gd. All right. So we can rearrange and solve for v final. We get that v final is the square root of 2 m2 minus m1 gd over m2 plus m1. All right. So now we can go ahead and put in the numbers. So this will be square root of 2 times, oops, sorry, 10 kilograms minus 5 kilograms times 9.8 newtons per kilogram. And again, here it will be more convenient to re-express that as meters per second squared times 1 meter over 10 kilograms plus 5 kilograms. All right, so same deal here. You'll have meters per second squared times meters will give you meters squared per second squared that when you square root it gives you meters per second. Here you've got kilograms in numerator and denominator. They'll cancel, so it all works out. And you get 2.56 meters per second. So here you might argue that this might be a little simpler than when we did this before with forces. Because when we did this before with forces, we, we weren't able to neglect the forces of tension. We had to treat the two masses as separate free bodies. We had to express that tension was also acting on these. And we had to solve for tension and substitute into the other equation to eliminate the tension. And it was a bit of a hassle. So here, this is certainly a little faster. It saved us some algebra because we were able to make the tension in the string internal to the system. So we didn't care. All right. Let's do another one here, just to get maybe another little bit of sense of it. Let's say that we've got a crate, mass m, and let's say it's initially sliding at 10 meters per second. Let's say the coefficient of kinetic friction between the crate and the surface is 0.25. Um, and we're just going to let it slide to a stop. What we want to know is how far did it slide? So we're asking for what's the displacement equal to. All right, so let's go and take a look at our forces and the displacement. So here, We've got potentially up to three forces to worry about, but we'll see that two of them won't matter at all, and we will eventually extend that out a bit. So we've got a force of kinetic friction opposing the motion, we've got a normal force up, and we've got a gravity down. And then our displacement, Yeah, let's not make it quite that extreme. And our displacement is pointing off to the right. And again, it's not a force. That's why I'm drawing it with a different kind of arrow in a different color. All right, let's work out the angles for each of these. So the angle between the normal force and the displacement is 90 degrees. And the angle between gravity and the displacement is 90 degrees. And let me pick a different color here just to tell them apart. 
and the angle between kinetic friction and the displacement is 180 degrees. So when we figure out the work done by the normal force, it'll be equal to the normal force, whatever it is, times the displacement times the cosine of 90 degrees. But the cosine 90 is zero, so the work is zero. Same deal with gravity. And this turns out to always be the case. If a force is acting, is always acting perpendicular to the motion, it doesn't do any work. All it can do is attempt to change the direction. And here, gravity and normal force are trying to change the direction of the motion in opposite directions and are getting canceled out in that. So we're just left with finding the work done by kinetic friction. So it'll be equal to force of kinetic friction times the displacement times the cosine of 180 degrees, but the cosine of 180 is negative one. So I can write this as minus FKD. All right, so it turns out that we're not going to be completely out of the woods here. And this sometimes happens when we do work energy theorem stuff. We'll still have to do a tiny bit of Newton's second law, but it won't be horrible. Um, so here, when I put in our model of friction, this is minus mu k um, times the normal force times the displacement. I need to find the normal force. And from that, I have to go and use Newton's second law of motion. But I don't have to worry about the x part of it at all. I just need to worry about the y part. Um, which is normal force up minus gravity down equals m a sub y, which is zero because all the motion is happening in x. So this gives us that the normal force is equal to the force of gravity is equal to mg. So I can take that and stick it in here for the normal force to get that the net work which is also equal to the work done by kinetic friction, because that's all there is, is minus mu k m g d. Okay, so now we can put that into our work kinetic energy theorem, which says that the network is equal to k final minus k initial. So minus mu k m g d equals one half m v final squared minus one half mv initial squared. And here v final was zero because we let it uh, skid to a rest. And let's see, we've got minus signs on both sides which cancel, which is good because when we take a square root, taking a square root of a negative number to get a speed would be really sketchy. I don't know what the square root of negative one meters per second, square root of negative one meters per second is. All right, and also I didn't tell you the mass, so it's a good thing that canceled too. All right, so solving, we can times through by two and take the square root. We get V initial, sorry, my bad. Uh, we're solving for D, of course. So D will be equal to V initial squared over two mu k g d. Alrighty. So again here, this is 10 meters per second squared over two times 0 0.25 times 9.8 newtons per kilogram. Um, sorry, we're solving for d, so there of course is not a d down there. All right, and here again, it'll be more fruitful to express as meters per second squared. So when I square the numerator, I'm gonna have meters squared over second squared, but the denominator is just meters per second squared. So the one over second squareds will cancel, one power of meters will cancel, and I'll be left with meters, and in fact, it will be 20.4 meters. Alrighty, so what if an object is also rotating? 
Um, there, it turns out that to properly define the kinetic energy, um, we'll have to say it's equal to the rotational kinetic energy plus the trans, sorry, the translational kinetic energy plus the rotational kinetic energy. So this part here accounts for the, this is the one half mv squared part we've been looking at so far. This accounts for the motion of the center of mass, but remember for any rigid object to completely describe it, you have to talk about the motion of the center of mass plus the motion around the center of mass. And using arguments similar to what we've already done, it turns out that the rotational kinetic energy would have to be one half I omega squared. So we can say, take a look at um, a ball that we, um, sorry here. So let's say we have a ball rolling down an incline, like so. Um, let's say, just again, to keep it consistent here, that this incline is 10 meters high. Um, all right, so we'll start with our ball here at rest. And down here, we would like to know how fast the ball is going. Now the thing is, is that some of the work that gravity is going to do on this is going to go into um, translating the ball, but some of it's just plain going to go into spinning up the ball. So we'll have to take that into account. And so the key assumption that we're going to have to make here is that the ball is rolling without, without slipping. So what does that mean? Well, if we go and take a look here at the side of this, and we see the ball rolling like so, the center of mass is moving with velocity v. But we've already seen before that right at the contact patch here, if you're not slipping, the velocity right at that very point has to be zero. So the only way that it happened is, so if this is our side view of it, is from the perspective of the ball. The ball just says, hey, I'm just sitting here, spinning around, doing my thing. It would only make sense if the tangential velocity of the points at the end, at the outside of the ball, were that same speed v. Then what would happen is this point here would be moving forward with v, due to translation, but backward with V at V due to the rotation. And so with combining the two together, this point here would be instantaneously at rest, and so the ball would be not slipping. We remember the tangential velocity is equal to R omega, so our condition for rolling without slipping is that V equals R omega. Now it is possible to roll with slipping. Um, if you go bowling, for instance, um, the way a lot of people uh, roll the bowling ball out of their hand, the ball actually has backspin on it. And especially because there's oil on the uh, lane, it can take quite a while for friction to slow up that backspin and eventually turn it into forward spin. And then eventually you'll get to a point where you roll without slipping. And that's usually when you see the ball bite and start to take a bit of a hook. And so skilled bowlers, I'm definitely not one of those, but skilled bowlers can time it out so that the ball catches the bite just right so that it goes either between the 
the pocket between the one and three pin or the one and two pin, depending on whether they're bowling right or left-handed. And they do it in just the right way to be able to throw a strike. Like I said, I am not a skilled bowler, so there you go. But we can go ahead and take a look at this. So our displacement is going to be down the ramp, like so. And let's say this angle here is theta. All right. So there are two forces acting on the bowling ball. Um, there is the normal force and there is gravity. So the normal force here Pardon me a second. Uh, I'm trying to draw in my displacement. The normal force here is perpendicular to the displacement. So again, we can conclude that the normal force does no work because they're perpendicular. So, but for gravity, this is our angle phi here. And by the second law of inclined planes, if this is theta, that's theta, but that's a right angle. So phi is equal to 90 minus theta. So the work done by gravity will be the force of gravity times the displacement times the cosine of 90 minus theta. But the cosine 90 minus theta is sine theta. And if we look here, this height h will be my hypotenuse d times the sine of theta here because this is the opposite and that's the hypotenuse. So we can write that this is equal to fg times h or mgh. All right, so with that, we can do the work kinetic energy theorem. So here the network will be equal to the work done by gravity is equal to K final minus K initial. The initial kinetic energy is zero. So we'll have the MGH equals one half MV final squared plus one half I omega final squared. So let's follow this through. So we can't cancel anything yet, but one half I omega final squared. Let's look at this. The moment of inertia of a sphere, which is what we're gonna model our ball as, is two fifths M R squared. I'll have an omega final squared. So now I do get some cancellations. Those twos cancel, and we have the mass of the ball canceling absolutely everywhere. Now this bit here, this r squared omega final squared, by our condition of rolling without slipping, has to be equal to v final squared. So now we can write gh equals one half v final squared plus one fifth v final squared. And that works out to be seven tenths v final squared. So we get that our final speed Will be the square root of 10 sevenths gh. So this will be the square root of 10 sevenths times 9.8 newtons per kilogram times 10 meters. Again, we'll write this meter squared per second squared. And again, the units will all work out and we will get 11.8 meters per second, which is slower than when we just plain dropped a rock 10 meters. So when we dropped a rock 10 meters, we got 14 meters per second. Here we're only getting 11.8. And what we can say is that some of the work was done 
to make the mass spin around its object. So some of that went into rotational kinetic energy, which meant that that work wasn't available to go into translational kinetic energy. Okay. I will finish up with two quick little notes. First note is what if you have forces that are varying? And by the way, that you'll see once we develop potential energy in the next video, this whole exercise we had to do right here will go a lot quicker. So let's say you have a force that is varying with time, or sorry, is varying. What you need to do is, let's say if it's acting in the x direction, you need to plot the x component of the force against the position. Let's say the force looks something like this as a function of position. The work done by the force would be equal to the area under the curve. The other tidbit is if a force is always perpendicular to the motion. So here, let's say you have a rubber ball tied onto a string or something like that, and you're whipping it around. So we can look, say, at some point right here it doesn't matter. At any point we look, the speed, of the velocity of the ball will be tangent to the curve and the, for, and the force will be directed in towards the center. Um, of the curve. There we go. And so this is 90 degrees, but then it's literally anywhere along here, it'll be 90 degrees. So at all times, the velocity and the tension are perpendicular to each other. So in a case like this, if the force is always perpendicular to the velocity, then the work done by that force will be equal to zero. And that's because all that force can ever do is change the direction of motion. It can't change the speed. Alrighty then, in the next video, we will get into defining potential energy and things will hopefully get a bit easier. Catch you in the next one.